When you first came on the scene, mid-2000s and you were at the Junior World Championships, you were a time trialist. You were winning world championships in time trials. You're up there in the under-23s as well. Suddenly, you turn professional, and here's this guy beating Adam Blythe, by the way, oh, in the Tour I of remember. Poland. Four stages, I, I think, in that Tour of Poland. <laughs> and suddenly, you're a sprinter. How did that come about? Yeah, we were both, I think, in our wild years in that time, <laughs> yeah. you know, trying to, to show ourselves and, and be successful. Um, yeah, it was, for me, sprinting was always something that I uh, was good at um, already in my um, very early years when I was 13, 14 years old. But in the juniors, um, I also became good at time trialing. And um, thankfully. I <laughs> for a short period of uh, <laughs> of our cycling years, uh, yeah, it was a bit more. Um, there was more focus for me on on time trialing, not so much on sprinting. And um, I was also successful there. And the juniors became two time times junior world champion. And once you reach that um, that level, everyone says, "Yeah, you're a time trialist." But um, in the under 23, when I um, was at the at the end of the under 23, actually, I. I I won one more time a bronze medal at the World Championships in time trialing behind Taylor Finney and Luke Durbridge. And uh, after that, I became a professional. And there, I actually rediscovered also my, my sprinting abilities. And I've also, in the time in between, always won some sprints, but not really that much like I did in my professional time. But for me, this is incredible in terms of what you are... For a pro team, they look at what you're good at, what you're, what you're desirable at, what your profit is to a team, basically, because it is a business. Um, so for me, in terms of what I was valuable at is maybe win a race or two through the year and not the high-end sprinter like yourself were and Caleb Ewan's Mark Cavendish, but the guy that could win maybe a couple of races a year. And for you, was it when you turned professional, was it more of the fact that you were signed as a time trialist? You might be able to win a prologue, they might be on a time trial. <coughs> Sorry. Or is it more the fact that you were... They, they knew this sort of background that you were able to sprint. No, they. I'm not hundred percent sure if they knew um, that I was that good in a sprint. I don't think so. Um, Did you I know? Was, I knew I was good, but when you when you become professional, um, you have no idea how high the level will be there. So everything was new, and I just tried to to also sort of rediscover myself there and and what my talents are and. Um, I was always that kind of shy person in the beginning, so I just tried to do my job and my training and everything as good as possible, and I will see what the outcome will be. So when I became um, a pro in 2011 um, on a pro continental, so second level team, um, Ske Shimano back then, I, I was there to work in the lead out for the sprinter, Kenny van Hummel at that time in the team. The only problem was that before the season started, in the December training camp, I <laughs> had to do training sprints against Kenny. I know I, where this is going. I started to beat Oops. him already in the training sprints. And um, he didn't really like that at all. So he also asked them to, to not do training sprints anymore with me. Um, and uh, yeah, after that, uh, in the first races in, in the Tour de Langkawi, a tour of Langkawi in, in Malaysia, we, we were there together, Kenny and I, and we never had a bad relationship, not at all. He's a really good guy, and I always had a lot of fun with him. And the first stage that we did, um, I had to do the lead out for them. I had no idea what I was doing. There was pure chaos. I lost them all. I really, I destroyed the whole lead out for them. And then, so in the debriefing, uh, in the evening, they said to me, okay, Marcel, listen to us. Tomorrow and the day after, we will do the lead out for you. And you just look uh, at us, what we are doing, and you just try to learn from it. So the second stage, we, we did it like that, and it went already much better. And the third um, stage, they did a lead out again for me, and I won. So I had my first professional victory in my third race as a pro. And uh, from that point on, Kenny and I had separate race programs. <laughs> 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 but uh, it was still very nice of him um, that he gave me the chance. So it says a lot also about him. A lot of wins, 89, I think, in total, in your professional career. Um, that year, you raced the Tour of Poland against this man. That's where you really exploded onto the scene, I think, if I remember rightly. Do you remember, was there any talk about Marcel after those early wins in, in your team? Um, I can't really remember too much. I think it was 2011. 
mm-hmm. or 2012, 2011. 11. Um, yeah, I just, I really remember that more than anything, more than anything, that downhill sprint that Grown Awake and sadly crashed on a couple of years ago. But it was, I think we had a few sprints that year and I can't remember too much, but I, I remember you coming onto the scene and being... Uh, yeah, the man basically, and you had the lead out nailed, and I think it was, I think that was more than anything. It wasn't necessarily. I think as a bike rider, you never look at someone in particular, unless it's a classics. You never look at someone in particularly. Oh my God, he's amazing. He's not a Tom Boone. He's not this. He's not that. He's not a, a Cavendish. We always put it down to, as we still do now with the sprinters. We look, it's the train. It's the train. It's the train. We need to disrupt the train and. I think that was the early days of it, and I think as you grew more, it was it was always a train, but at the end of the train you had this rocket, and it was you at that time, which <laughs> it was. Um, I can't I can't remember it too much to be honest, but it was just so much of a. For me personally, it was just so much you you get on and deal with it, but it was just sort of your. For me, I remember you winning. It was that Marcel. He's on the scene, and it was never looking back at you and thinking. You're a time trialist, but it's just like you're here now. You're present. You've you've dominated. You are a person to be, as with any sprint, a cur mess. No matter what race it is, if you're beating the highest of the highest level, you're someone to think about. You're someone to worry about. Mm-hmm. And that was for me. Marcel is here. I, what I remember is um, when I became a pro and we started to do sprints against each other. I uh, I realized that. Um, they are the smart guys, and you were one of the smart guys. Thank the one, you. Thank maybe you. not the fastest one. I definitely wasn't. Not the fastest <laughs> one, but you, you had to fight for every single thing, every a single meter that you, that you, uh, that you needed uh, for a good position in the sprint. You had to fight it for yourself, yeah. mostly. And um, so you had to be clever from the beginning, and I had to learn that. So I was actually the stupid strong guy, um, which a re- luckily, who had a really good luckily. team. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I had to learn a lot. Um, and you see that often with young guys that come to the sport. Either they are already very clever, um, and mostly I think the very talented guys, they, they, they still need to learn a lot. And I, I think that was a bit of difference between us. Yeah, I think, I, do you know when you, look, when you mention that, it's, it's not necessarily sprinters as well. I think it's the whole oh, yeah. peloton completely. I think it's if you look at the world's greatest, you know, Alberto Contador, every single person along the line, even Cancellara, I know he's in the room, maybe not in the room, but somewhere behind the scenes tonight. I think there's always mistakes that they're made which are so basic, so simple. And I think it's, as you highlighted, it's, it's the basic mistakes that end up in quite a big impact for a sprinter, not necessarily a classics rider or a Grand Tour rider, but for yourself as a sprinter, the basic sort of instincts, if you don't have it, trying to learn that can be quite a challenge. And mm-hmm. I do remember um, there was a Kerr mess in Belgium, I've forgotten the name, and I ran second to you. I can't quite remember what it is, but I remember almost running up alongside you, and it was just because you got held back from the, from the lead out. And it was that kind of mistake, which it would have been me or him at that point, and obviously you got it somehow. Um, but yeah, it was, it was sort of the mistakes you could take advantage of, but the more you grew as a rider, and sadly for me, the more you grew as a rider, the less I got to race with you, just because your program keep evolving. You got into the bigger race, you got into the higher race, you got into all the world tour races, the little races yeah. anymore, the learning stopped. Yeah, no, it's all about learning. Yeah. And, and that came with the team as well, because the team was really developing at that time, wasn't it? Skill Shimano, then to Giant uh, Shimano, Giant Alpacine, it became Sunweb and, and developed and snowballed. And then obviously you had, you were a sprinting team when you were there. They then became a Grand Tour winning team at the Giro d'Italia as well. A lot of wins along the way. You went a quick step too. What were some of your favorite wins when you were out there being the best sprinter in the world? Um, in my favorite win with uh, quick step was definitely the team time trial uh, world championships and it has nothing to do with sprinting. But Seriously? It's just, yeah, it's just about wow. the fact that I love um, that's what I always loved about sports and, and cycling in particular, um, how we had to work together to achieve that. And um, it was a crazy experience to be there with uh, Nikki Terpstra and Tony Martin and Yves Lampert in, and Bob Jungles in a, in a team to, to ride. I don't know how fast we were, I think 55 average or something. Um, 
to a world um, champion title. I don't know about you, but I find that fascinating just because that's an event, a much maligned event, I think, that a lot of people will think, oh, I'm not sure if I miss watching the, the trade team time trial. Um, I think a lot of people like it how it is now. Germany had that brilliant result in Tony Martin's last race this year to win it. Um, that really surprises me, but it's also heartening to know that you were a team man as well. Yeah, no. I think for me as well it's quite surprising because I think, I don't know, you'll probably be able to tell more about it, but I think the the sacrifice. Well, he was there. <laughs> yeah, I think that I think the sacrifice that the team makes for you throughout that year is a lot of riders won't get a lot of benefit from it in terms of a win, but I think for you you get a lot of. I think for every sprinter, any sprinter that's delivering and winning, they got a lot of benefit. And obviously, there's the interviews, which uh, it's so obvious, really, in terms of I'd like to thank my team, blah 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 blah. And it's it's almost yeah. it's it's what you have to say because it is a massive thank you. But it's you hear it almost with every sprint that it is thank you to my team, thank you to my team. And I think you know you highlighting that as your most favourable moment throughout Grand Tour victories, no matter what victory it is, is incredible. It's, it's my, I mean, from that period, being on Quick Step, that was definitely a very, very special um, success for us. And I think also what you said, that yeah, every successful rider, especially sprinters, are trying to, to thank their team in a, a post-race interview. I think it's very normal. It's the least you, could, you can do to give back to your team. Um, and... That, that should and will always happen um, because it's, you need to be aware that you need a team. And I think that's also why I mentioned this success in Qatar, the, the, the world champion title. I mean, there it was about all of us and, 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 and being me, me being a part of the team there uh, and sort of also giving back to, to those guys to have an, uh, yeah, a victory together. And um, that was a special moment for me in my career, but, but certainly also... Um, yeah, the Grand Tour stage wins. Oh, yeah, they, they were beautiful victories and, and ones that I really will always keep in my memory. Apart from the team time trial, what was your favourite? You can't take the team time trial. You've got to think of one victory. There was a lot, I guarantee. Maybe that, that race in Belgium, maybe that Kermis where I was second. No? <laughs> <laughs> No, I think it's pretty obvious. Um, uh, for me, the the special, most special victory was the first Tour de France stage victory that I had in my career, winning in Corsica, being able to uh, wear afterwards the uh, yellow jersey for a day. That was that was a beautiful experience, and and definitely also repeating it a year later um, against all the expectation that everyone has um, in a an incredible uh, surrounding there in Harrogate with so many spectators. It was beautiful to ride there and, and especially beautiful to win there. Marcel, it's fascinating hearing you talking about the wins, the sport, the teammates. But I think that, um, especially after the couple of years that we've all had, there's something that you've been quite vocal about and you've talked about when you retired that I think we really need to touch on, which is how mental health issues are treated in cycling and in sport in general. I just wanted your thoughts on that. And you were very, very open about how you felt at the time, what, what, what was affecting you. And I think that was something that was really welcome to all of us watching on. And, and it, you know, I just wondered how you'd thought things had developed in the last 18 months, two years. Um, yeah, I mean, I have to say one thing. I'm not, I'm not uh, involved in the daily business um, anymore within a pro cycling team. So it's, it's hard to tell from the outside. Um, yeah, of course you hear things, but uh, I would say the general direction that the sport is heading um, into is, is, is good, is, um, yeah, is a direction where I think uh, many teams are aware of the, um, yeah, of, of the sport, how hard it is, what, what demands um, it has to, to the athletes and that performance is not only physical performance but also mental and performance. I think that's the most important thought that um, every, every team manager should keep in mind and in my career I made, um, I made two times the experience that um, when physical and mental performance are not in balance then you will not be successful at all and I think um, that's the conclusion, at least for me, out of my career and, and, and my experience from pro cycling, that 
this is yeah it has to be the the base of of everything else that you do as an athlete to keep that balance in your life um and I found mine now again, and uh, I also found it again throughout my my career after a difficult year 2015. Uh, for example, I realized I need change. I need to think about what I want as well. Otherwise, um, you can lose yourself in the sport a little bit, and um, that can be dangerous when you're I don't know 200 days a year uh, away from home or even more. You're constantly tired. Um, I mean, think about it. There's no other sport that is so hard and so demanding like pro cycling. No other sport has has a competition that lasts three weeks um, with only two rest days. And every day you do four, five, six hours um, of racing and competition. So um, that's very special. It's hard. It's demanding. It's special. I'm one of the most special athletes. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you, Marcel. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Marcel Kittel. Thank you.